Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Hi, everyone. This is Fei Wu from Phase World Podcast, a platform dedicated to sung and unsung heroes among us, and have stories told by themselves in the most authentic way possible. Today, I would like all of you to meet Jordan Harbinger. He is the host for an iTunes Top 50 podcast called The Art of Charm, a show and in-person training that teach you to become more charismatic in any situation, master your career by becoming a super connector, and revamp your love life and intimate relationships with confidence. The Art of Charm podcast receives over two million downloads per month, with over 440 episodes featuring guests such as Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin, Remy Sethi, and Noah Kagan. The Art of Charm week-long residential boot camp offers in-person training. It is currently only open to men, and Jordan explains in details during our conversation on why he needs to separate men and women. I thought his answers were absolutely fascinating. Jordan is already a very public figure, as you can imagine, so I guess he's more of a sung hero on Face World podcast. Why do we choose to have Jordan join us? I wanted to know and learn how Jordan deals with negative feedback or even hate mails. Spotting valid feedback has been a skill set that I've been developing for you know my, we've all been developing hopefully for our whole lives. And it's really, really crucial, and it's something that most of us never even think about. Seconds into our conversation, I felt so comfortable talking to Jordan, even though we had never met before or had a single conversation. I immediately open up about my own insecurity sometimes interviewing guests that are communication experts, while I couldn't string two words together. Jordan responded with similar experiences he had with his world-famous guests. He taught me an important lesson I will never forget, and have been sharing with many others ever since. You learn this skill set of rescuing yourself. There's so much to you being self-conscious and you being us as show hosts in general, and anybody who performs anything in their whole life of thinking, "I completely blew that," and you're totally fine most of the time. It's just anxiety. What was the early days like at the Art of Charm? Before millions of downloads, interviewing world-class leaders, businessmen about their hopes and dreams, how did Jordan start with his passion project? I think the idea that it was so fun and we were so blissfully ignorant was what kind of led us through all of those lean times. I couldn't start Art of Charm over again and make it again. It would just be too damn hard. Jordan hinted that he. Doesn't really regret the mistakes he made while running the art of charm early on as a hobby, and he probably wouldn't do anything differently. With that said, what are some of the lessons we could learn as podcasters and entrepreneurs? I knew Ramit back in 2007, 2008 too, and I was like, this guy really is focused on his business. We should do that, and we've been lucky that we're probably up in that same. Sort of level of success as him, but I guarantee you, he tested things that we tested just recently, and he probably tested them almost a decade ago. Our one-hour conversation goes above and beyond these questions, and I really appreciate you choosing to spend a precious hour of your time with us to navigate and to revisit this conversation. I welcome you to stop by faceworld.com, f e i s w o r l d, where you will find show notes, links, and other resources. A bonus section is also available from this interview, where Jordan reveals the entire setup for running the Art of Charm, from power conditioner to recording devices, post-production software, and other tips besides just the software and hardware. Without further ado, please welcome Jordan Harbinger from the Art of Charm.
your show is very authentic. And I actually went around the office today. Uh, I know a few people who are also listening to the Art of Charm, and and I asked the questions like, "What do you what do you like about Jordan and Jordan's style of interviewing people?" And then I think you like what they said, which is you're very authentic and you have the natural warmth, um, but at the same time you really get to the point. You drill into the questions. You don't let them let the guests off the hook very easily. And you really get to your point. You know, there's a lot of interviews you're like dancing around. It feels like the same idea or one party or the other trying to be too polite. And I'm guilty of that too. Um, but I like your style. It's very crisp and it's very engaging. It's so fascinating to talk to someone who's a podcaster and but your stats is outstanding, I must say. I've been listening to The Art of Charm, and I kind of take it for granted. And and uh, finally, as part of our conversation, I did the research of 2 million downloads per month, top 50 podcasts on iTunes, and that's that's more than top 1%, one, 1% if I'm uh, right with my math, and over 440 episodes, over probably 200 countries of listeners uh, tuning in every month. Does it feel real? I mean, does it, you know, does that like make you happy and thrilled? And do you think about those numbers at all? I do, but here's the thing. And I don't know if it's just me not being super amazing at math, read bad at math, but I can't wrap my mind around the numbers that much. So I find myself being like, oh, 90,000 people downloaded that. That's a lot compared to maybe another episode that only got 80,000 but I try to I try to think about college football games I'm not a football or sports fan by any means but I remember going to Michigan Stadium a decade plus ago when I was in college and they're like today there's 110,000 people watching and I'm like okay so if this is 110,000 people and this episode got 90 or 100,000 downloads basically a whole stadium like this at some point downloaded this episode of the show. But then it still doesn't really click in because some of those those people are so far away from you that even that, you know, you're in the middle of all that, you kind of don't really, you don't really feel it. Or you, you maybe even you feel that energy is a huge stadium, but it you don't think, I don't ever think like, wow, basically I'm talking to this whole stadium full of people. I mean, I fully realize there's people on their phone that are like, ah, click. They ever listen to anything or they're like, I'll stream this and then they forget or or whatever. And and also it's also really easy to look at some of my colleagues and friends who are they have a YouTube channel and they have like a million subscribers. And you've got to kind of parse it out because a, a podcast download is different than a YouTube subscriber, which is different than a YouTube view, which is different than a radio listener, which is different than a someone who bought something from you or a Facebook like like there's all these different metrics and they don't mean anything. So for me, I'm proud of what we've done. I would love to, you know, 5x my audience over the next 5 years if that's something that's possible or 10 exit over the next decade or less. But it it's all just kind of after a certain point, after a few thousand people, you're just kind of like I I don't really know because you can go to a bar or a club or an event with a thousand people and you're like, "Man, it's so crowded in here. The line for the bathroom is enormous." But after that, it's just a, it's just, it's like Greek counting where it was anything over, I think a thousand back in ancient Greece, they just said infinite because they're like, nah, there's no point in counting this. And that's kind of how it feels with, with podcasting. Don't get me wrong. Uh, when I'm trying to pay my mortgage, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. We have all these really cool fans and listeners and downloads and we can, you know, tell HostGator that they need to pay us this much money this year. That's great. And, and that's cool. And I, I try constantly to separate the number from the person. So I, I reply, I don't know if you know this, but I reply to all my email, like everything that comes in, unless it's absolutely patently ridiculous and insulting or something like that, I will reply to just about everything, which is thousands of messages every month. And that is, that's the struggle. Not wrapping your mind around how many people are listening, but trying to get to everybody so that they don't feel like you don't give a crap. And that's that's kind of like my unrealistic fear is that people will be like, oh, you know, you don't even care. You're just, you're just not even checking your email. So I might reply and I might be pretty short or I might send somebody a shortcut to something that they're looking for that's pre-scripted. But I, I'm there typing all of those emails. There's not somebody pretending to be me. There's not somebody in Bangladesh. And, and I find it kind of insulting because some people will be like, oh, whatever, your stupid virtual assistant, you know, wrote me back. I'm like, that was me 
first of all, that was me. And, and second of all, you know, who, who entitled you to a reply? This is something that I do kind of for me and for the, the show fans, but man, no good deeds sometimes, you know what I mean? That just shows, again, you're, you're up there and you know, I have never received any hate mails yet. Some people might have some something negative to say. You're being too nice, and all women podcasters are too nice. And uh, but it just shows. And when people does start replying with such negative feedback, and I think I think both Rami Seti and James Ultcher went in miles and talking about like you know people were threatening James to like you know to kill him or something, and some crazy stuff going on, and. I really personally still can't believe there are people out there. And then I'm glad that they're not really impacting you. You can just like filter them out. Yeah. I mean, I get stupid emails like that a lot and I'll get people that are like, you're just a scammer. And I'm like, well, all right. You know, at first it used to be like, oh my God, how dare you? But the last several years, I just kind of think of, okay, what's this person really dealing with in their, I tr you know, it's a compassion exercise, really. What's this person dealing with in their life where, Somebody who's been around for a, almost a decade now, this is the ninth year of the show as of January 2016, yeah. and been running programs that are life-changing, that have really good reviews, that have a really strong alumni network of people who've graduated that still participate in helping other people who've just recently graduated from our live programs and have had listeners for who've been listening for nine of those years that still write in all the time and tweet and Facebook. It's like, who's this random person who... All of that evidence aside is still like, this is a scam. I mean, where have they been burned and why is their self-esteem so low that anything that looks like it can help them, they just immediately dismiss as that. And, and I just feel bad for people like that because, the, the, to put it bluntly, it's such a loser mindset that I just feel like, wow, this person's life must really kind of suck and I'm really glad that, they're, that that's not me because yeah. – it's what's that expression? But for the grace of God, go I. Where you see somebody who's really down on their luck, and you're mm -hmm. like, "Wow, that could totally be me," except for cosmic coincidence that made me start podcasting and slash be born in the United States and have great parents. I mean, all of those things are are luck, really. They're just you know luck of the draw. So I try to bear that in mind when people are like, "I'll kill you. You you're such a bad person." I'm like, "Yo, real reality check." I run a podcast that has a blog element, like what have I done to you that could possibly elicit that reaction? And then I have to kind of gut check myself and go, okay, nothing, all right, dismiss, not, not relevant to my life, let this person go pick on somebody else on you know blog comments or YouTube and just leave it alone. You might like this because I know we all get very angry thinking about that these people exist and you know, you're, you're doing service, not only to men, clearly in this case, you know, I, as a woman, I'm impacted in such a positive way. I've directed a lot of my guy friends to listen to your podcast as well. But you might like this saying, I, I don't remember the source of it, saying, you know, they're famous people or people who have done something become statues and pigeons will shit on statues. So you have to make a choice. Do you want to be a statue? Do you want to be a pigeon? I love that. I've never heard that, but that's amazing. I love it. So, so true. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, you know, it's it's hard because at some point, I never thought of myself as artistic or creative at all. And and sometimes when people say like, oh, this is this, or you're, you're supposed to be that, you're some kind of like artistic or creative person, I still have trouble sort of swallowing that identity. Um, but I will say that I definitely get offended like an artist and sensitive like an artist because people will write back and they'll be like, hey, uh, even even if uh, even if it's not offensive, I take things really personally. Sometimes, if the feedback is structured really well, and I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way. Maybe I should say take it to heart because people will say, "Hey, look, I'm an audio engineer, and you've got this thing is driving me friggin' crazy." And the good part is, I take that feedback and submit it to our own engineers, and they go, "Oh yeah, you know this guy's right," or "That guy doesn't know what the heck he's talking about," and it makes the show better because people can give feedback. And it can be really valuable, but I, I will also say that it took me years to realize that 95% of feedback is super uneducated and has absolutely nothing to do with making your show better, at least not for the audience. It has to do with other people's insecurities. And that's true across the whole spectrum of life in my experience where somebody will say something like, I, I literally got this email a couple weeks ago. Hey, you should do another version of your podcast that's only like 10 minutes long and just has the important stuff so we don't have to listen to all the other crap that you're talking about. 
And I was just like, well, aside from being completely socially inept, which this person obviously is, they clearly don't really understand that a lot of the value in what we do is the interaction between the guest and the host. It's not about getting a list of five bullets of things you've got to do next because without context, all that stuff is useless. And so when you extrapolate that, you go, wow, this, this person probably doesn't listen or look at or read context at all very well. They're probably completely unable to do that. And so this is probably hurting them throughout their whole life. So don't change. I'm not going to change the show and make it 10 minutes long. And just for this one person, it doesn't make sense to do that. And so you really have to take feedback again in context, which is impossible to do in an email. So if somebody says, look, I've been listening to your show for nine years. Here's what I love. By the way, I would love to see more of X, Y, and Z. That's great feedback. This person knows me better than most of my friends probably at this point, right? They've been listening for so long. The, the guy who goes, I found your show last week. I really want to hear more podcasts about insert ridiculous topic that's been covered 87 times seven years ago. They didn't even search the website. That's not really feedback. And that that's the same thing in your life where, you know, your, your, your boss might say, look, you've been here for three years. I would love to see more of this take on a leadership role. That's great feedback. The person you went out on one date with and they were like, you're too short. That's not feedback. That's their own weird thing coming into play don't listen to that. You can't get taller anyway. But there, there'll be tons of totally invalid feedback. And spotting valid feedback has been a skill set that I've been developing for, you know, my, we've all been developing, hopefully, for our whole lives. And it's really, really crucial. And it's something that most of us never even think about. We either take all of it or we reject it because our ego says, screw you, I'm, you should like me the way I am, which is also a crappy fixed mindset. It's funny, I you know had lunch with a coworker today, and this is precisely what we we're talking about. But you know, there are young people and older people included. But like a lot of us, don't deal with negative feedback, you know, uh, in front of our families. We're certainly not at work, uh, oftentimes, because we're trying to create this harmony, and we're all trying to be a little more conservative, a little careful with what we say. But I think you're in, you and me gradually kind of into that public space. And I really still feel crazy and kind of insecure. And I'm so comfortable talking to you, which is the feeling I haven't had um, interviewing some of the other uh, guests who I've never met before. I get nervous. I get this like weird and stupid rush of saying, I'm not worthy, you know, these are professional, and they truly are professional communicators. And I couldn't put two words together and overanalyzing myself. And so I'm so glad you're saying this because I think it's in addition to sort of the outside force and what other people are telling you, but at the same time, internally with me, uh, leaving an interview saying, oh, that person was great and I, I was a hot mess. And then when I during post-production, it's like, oh, I wasn't so bad, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, doing giving yourself feedback in the moment is not a good idea. I, I've got a producer that's with me live on every show that I record. His name's Jason. You probably have heard of him a million times because I thank him at the end of every show. And there's many, there are many times where we have a back channel where we can communicate. There are many times where I'm like, "Am I blowing this or what?" And he's like, "No, it's fine." Or I'm like, "Oh, is it just me or is am I totally unprepared and I completely?" And he'll be like, "No, it's fine. It's totally unnoticeable." Sometimes he's lying to make me feel better, but most of the time he's like, "No, the episode turned out really well." And I'm like, "Everyone can tell I'm hungover." It's like that first time you you tried pot in college and you're like, "Everyone knows I'm high," and everyone's like, "No one knows you're high except you keep talking about it." That's kind of how I feel on my show. I don't smoke marijuana. I haven't smoked probably for 15 or 20 years now. It's a one-time thing in college, but I will tell you, I still get paranoid that I'm blowing it in the middle of a show. And yeah, I've, absolutely. You know, if I really blow it, it gets cut out. But I will tell you, it's been you learn this skill set of rescuing yourself and sometimes sometimes I'll I'll pull something out of thin air and I will at the end of the show Jason will go I can't believe you just came up. Were you thinking of that as you went along and I'm like, "Yeah, I can't believe it." And that just comes with practice. But but I will say there's so much about there's so much to you being self-conscious and you being uh, us as show hosts in general and anybody who performs anything in their whole life of thinking I completely blew that and you're totally fine most of the time. It's just anxiety triggering it like a hyper critical feedback loop that makes it the worst. And, and I will, I'll cap it with this. A lot of times when you interview professional communicators, I'll say some of the worst shows that I've ever done 
have been with people who supposedly teach communication skills. And I think the reason, there's a lot of context there too, speaking of context, that people who claim to be amazing communication experts, a lot of times they're so unaware of themselves, not aware of themselves, unaware of themselves, that they don't realize they're actually really bad communicators. So they're so confident. This is like that Dunning-Kruger effect. Have you ever heard of that? They just, they don't know how bad they are, so they just assume, I'm so good at this. Why do other people find this hard? And they'll come on the show, and they'll talk over you, and they won't have any valid points, and they'll make a joke, and they'll laugh at their own joke, and they'll just keep moving, and it's like you're not even there. And you think, oh, I get it. You just pitch really well. Companies bring you in as a quote-unquote communications expert. You, you train, you steamroll everyone, and then you leave and cash your check, and nobody ever has the guts to say, what the hell was that? Yeah, and I, you know what I also struggle with, uh, to your point, is I think it was on your show, uh, I don't remember the guest, but you mentioned that you know when you interview these quote-unquote professional communicators or semi-famous or tier two people, they tend to have these go-to stories. They yeah. barely steer. I mean, there's just, it's so hard for me to pull the information or anything other than what they haven't already talked about hundreds of times. Um, so that, ha- that has been a struggle for me. But Yeah, we call uh, those sound bites. And the reason, I mean, obviously the, the reason we call them sound bites should be pretty obvious, but the, the sort of rationale behind it, which, which makes perfect sense, is that they've done the interview so many times that they, and they've worked with PR people and usually people are selling something. So yeah. for me, it's actually pretty easy because when I'm on podcasts or radio, I'm just like, hey, go listen to The Art of Charm. I don't have to say there's over 500 hours of this and that and the other. Like I, no one... It's, it's not really a great way to do it, and it, again, it's really uh, inauthentic. But if your whole ROI, your whole return on investment is that you're going to sell a couple copies of your book, you just won't shut the hell up about your book. So these people all have sound bites like, oh, I'm glad you asked that, Faye, because in my book, in Chapter 17, entitled Giving Sound Bites on Air, I discuss seven major points, and I'll give you the first three, and the rest you can find in my book at phaseworldpodcast.com. It's just like, ugh. God's sake, this is awful. And um, one of the tactics that I have for getting, if you're interested, for getting rid of people's sound bites is I always book 90-minute show slots. But you'll notice The Art of Charm is only about 45, 50 minutes long, and that includes with advertisements and with the intro and with the close that we don't record during the, the booking with the guest. And the reason is because there are people, especially the more well-known folks, the authors and the performers, those people – what we'll do is we'll just let them talk for the first 30 minutes or so, which is well over the average interview length that these people are used to for their little radio and maybe TV sound bites. And after 30, 40 minutes, they're tired. And, and we just cut all of that garbage most of the time. So they'll come through and they'll give all of their fancy sound bites, some of which are interesting and we keep, and most of which are just, you know, their kind of their deal, their pitch, their spiel. And we just di- we just dump it, and then we get them answering real questions, and that's one of the reasons why people go, "Gosh, you know, this is you really get to the point." It's like, well, no, I just cut off the part where the guest couldn't get to the point, and then we got to the point. I don't do it that fast. I do it faster than most, maybe, but it's not instant like it seems. It's it's the fact that they, we just let them tire them. It's like having kids. I don't have kids. And I don't know if you do, but if you let them run around long enough, they'll take a nap. And that's exactly what I'm doing on air. I want them to chill out and get real. And sometimes you just got to let them run in circles until they do. This is Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Face World Podcast. Today, I am with Jordan Harbinger, show host and coach from The Art of Charm. Jordan shares his nine-year journey of The Art of Charm from a passion project to a legacy business. I hope you share this conversation as well as your own feedback with us via faceworld.com, where you can also explore other conversations with guests invited to FaceWorld. You can now listen to FaceWorld and subscribe via iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. Back to the show. Great advice. And as you were talking, I just realized one of the episodes I suffered with the most, I could have done so much better knowing that the first 15 minutes was such, was not interesting. Um, and so, and then to your point, it's like when other people listen to this, they don't know the backstory. So 
they won't persevere through the first 15 minutes. Why don't, why don't we lead them into the most interesting when the energy actually picks up? Yeah. Oh man, this is so valuable. Uh, I don't have kids and I teach little kids Taekwondo and you just have to run them around and then they can actually have the energy to listen to you. Yeah. They need to burn out. And, and that's true for, for these, these uh, thought leaders or influencers or whatever kind of buzzword, because they their goal is to get their message out to people and what they think their message is is their spiel for their book or their product our goal is different our goal is to get a good interview and a good show and to really get kind of something that they haven't talked about much that they're really good at most of which mainstream media that they've done in the past isn't interested in anyway so they don't realize that your goals don't necessarily align and even if they try to match your goals, they kind of don't know how to do it. They've probably never done it. So yeah, you let them burn out and, and there's plenty in there that you can keep. I'm not saying you just get rid of everything and there's no ROI in it for them. Usually the show that they do with us, our goal is for them to go, dang, I've never had this kind of response. I've never been asked this before. That makes it more interesting. But, but if they've been conditioned by their PR people and their media people to just go and pitch because they have 17 minutes to get their URL out a total of five times, that's what they're used to and that's how they're going to run it. So you can just clip. And that's the beauty of pre-recorded media. You can just do whatever you want. And you, you just have to be responsible and not make people look bad or, or have them communicate or look like they're communicating in a way that they didn't intend to. I, I like to think we make them look better. And I think most of our guests agree with that. And I love how you're, this is so valuable. I feel like just <laughs> you're giving away some of the most valuable information. It makes me feel so much better because I'm not physically in LA and I go there once a year. When, as I'm listening to The Art of Charm, I feel like I'm missing out so much on the in-person training that you conduct on a weekly basis. I believe it's to men only. Can women join that too? No, I mean, we have in-person training for women, but it's done differently. Our, our boot camps and workshops are generally for men. We do have some for women, but the ones we do for men are residential, where they stay in the house in Los Angeles for a week at a time. We've got two properties there, and we run these programs every single week. The ones we do for women are more one-on-one, -on -one, and they don't stay in the house. They don't stay residential. Either the coach will come to them or they will stay at a hotel in LA and do it that way. And the reason is because the goals that guys come in with are a lot different. The science of, a, of if they're coming in for like dating purposes or charisma purposes, the sciences between what makes a man and a woman charismatic and magnetic are completely different. And the last and possibly most important thing is in order to get to the root of the issue for most people, especially guys, we need them to get really vulnerable and it takes a really, really long time. There's a lot of building comfort and trust with each other and with the coaches. But if you have any estrogen or too much, I should say, estrogen or any female within 100 yards of the place, when guys are opening up about their fears and their secrets and things like that, it, it will it will slam shut like a mousetrap. And we even have our female coaches who are trained and all of this stuff. They even have, they, they're not there all the time for that reason because the male ego is so powerful that even when we want to control it, we can't. Uh, without a lot of practice anyway. And so we just have to make it really conducive. And so you can't have mixed classes. And again, you know, we're teaching from experience for a lot of this stuff. And, and so it becomes a lot harder to have a mixed group or anything like that. But we do have coaching for women. It's just not the same style as it is for men. It's so magical for you to be in the middle of all this to observe, absorb, and and being able to talk about it you know, is there anything you've learned about yourself? I mean, were you surprised by how difficult it is for men to be vulnerable? Or you kind of, were you kind of prepared for that, I guess? Um, we were kind of prepared for it because we were the same way, right? Mm -hmm. It took us years to, it, it took us years to get there. And so I, I definitely understand. I don't think like, oh, these guys can't be vulnerable. That's so weird. It's like, yeah, these guys can't be vulnerable because... It's really hard. And so we just make it really comfortable, really, really comfortable. You know, we don't ask people to divulge crazy stuff the first day they get there. Most guys will. Um, and we have just a close knit group of guys. Anybody who's negative or judgy gets shut down like just so quick with prejudice, basically. And we screen the attendees. I mean, I, I've got phone calls with guys before they come in 
My assistant has phone calls with guys before they come in. One of our head coaches has the same call with the guys before they come in. So if there's going to be somebody who's not a good fit, we just say no. I mean, we're sold out months in advance. So we don't really like need, we don't need to go, well, this guy's a crummy fit, but we got to pay the bills. I mean, we don't have that problem, thankfully, anymore. So we're just so happy to screen out people that we think are going to be a pain in the butt. Are you planning on traveling to other states? Because I assume you get a lot of these local guys and then you're in LA and to us here on the East Coast, like those are the happiest guys. Like they're so confident. They're, you know, the weather is great. And but what about us? Like what about people in New England? (laughs) Yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's not local guys. In fact, when we did our taxes, we had to figure out how many clients even came from California, where we're based, and it was like 10%. And we don't have to pay certain types of taxes on people that are not Americans, uh, citizens, and that was like a double-digit percentage of our clients as well, more than a high double digit. So people come from all over the world. Oh, US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, France, and we've had handfuls of guys from countries like China, Japan, Middle East, Italy, uh, we have guys from all over the world. Yeah, so so whenever people go, oh, I can't make it, I live in Arizona, I'm like, look, man, that excuse might work for you and other areas of your life, like I can't get to the gym, it's too far away, but this is a week-long program, you gotta fly here anyway. So, and, and I kind of feel, not kind of, I feel like this, look, you want something that's gonna change your whole outlook on life and give you a skill set that's gonna change the way that you behave and help you network and maintain connections and improve the the relationship you have with your wife and your kids. If you can't get on a plane for that, you don't deserve it. And in fact, if you won't get on a plane for that, I know you're full of crap anyway about making big changes because successful people will fly to the other side of the globe to go to a conference, meet the right people, do the right kind of training. Somebody who makes an excuse that they've got to get in the car for five hours or drive to the airport and spend a couple hundred bucks to get here, those that's a loser mindset. And, and I'm not saying everybody who thinks that way is a loser, but what I am saying is if things like that stop you from succeeding, wow. I mean, that's just such a low obstacle. It's legal, safe, and and easy to travel across the United States slash the globe these days. So when people make excuses about why they can't do it or, oh, I can't get the time off work, I know it's baloney. And I know it's just the same excuse they tell themselves for why they can't do other things. It's just one of a billion excuses that control that person's life. And at some level, I feel bad for them, but not bad enough to try to really convince them of it because I got other people who can't wait to get here. And Mm. so I just focus on those guys. It's totally self-selected. And I, so funny, I had no intention of, of, I didn't realize how interested I am in this program. So now I learned that these guys are coming from all over the world. I, I, I will conclude with my final question, but what is it like to have a single program and approach while you have such different, huge diversity of men speaking not only different languages, but also cultural background? I mean, Asia, Europe, you know, how do you, how do you tailor your program to everybody in, in the classroom? Yeah, it's tough. And that's a great question. And you you actually nailed it. We do tailor it. And the reason that we have to do that is because of the cultural background. And you've got a 23-year-old kid from China, and you've got a 35-year-old guy who's married from Indiana, and a Canadian guy who's 28 and single. So there's all these different guys here. And some of them are military, and some of them, blah, blah, blah. English is our second language. So we cap the programs at 10 guys, and we have several coaches, because we need to dig deep with everybody over the six days that they're here. And you just can't do that when you've got a room full of 50 guys. So it's kind of funny. People sometimes will say, well, I'm deciding between Art of Charm and this other thing. And it's like, well, do you want to stand in a room and stare at a PowerPoint presentation? Or do you want to sit down and get coaching hands-on from a bunch of different people who actually really know what you want to get out of it and are going to help you get there? So it's different. I mean, we've we've had clients in here that are 69-year-old guys and they're in the same class as a 25-year-old guy, and they've got very different goals, very different life experience, and yeah, we've got to take all of that into account, and it's, it's exhausting. That's why my coaches, they rotate, because otherwise they'll burn out, and you know we'll find them teetering from the roof <laughs> if, if we made them work four weeks in a row, because it's, it's a tough job, and, and we just we put everything into our clients and our students. So you're right. It's it's got to be tailored. It's no easy task, and it's something that we work on with every single group of guys. That's beautiful. 
And thanks for sharing your stories. But if you don't mind, I'm going to jump around because I am really interested in learning more about you. In particular, there's one thing I've been contemplating recently is, not sure who said this again, but um, people are saying when you talk to entrepreneurs, creators such as yourself, um, I want to ask you the question of what were you like when you were a 10-year-old boy and what are some of the dreams and wishes you had um, back then? So when I was a 10-year-old boy, I, oh man, I, I was probably pretty bossy and I was pretty strong-willed. My parents tell me all the time, they're like, you would ask for something over and over and if we said no, you would spend a ton of time researching it and I would ride my, this is pre-internet, I'd ride my bike to the library and I would call the stores that sold whatever it is or call people that knew about it. So now that you mention it, looking back on this, I probably was interviewing people when I was a little kid because I remember wanting a stereo when I was like 11 and I called, uh, this is so funny, I've never thought about this, a really good question. I called this electronic store and they would tell me all about the stereos and I would say, okay, how much is it? And they would say, oh, we can't quote prices over the phone. You have to come in. And I would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why? And nobody would tell me the honest answer, which was we want to get you here so we can sell you the stupid stereo. One guy said, it's illegal. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. And he was like, yeah, it's illegal. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense at all. So I hung up and I called the police, not the emergency line, just the regular police. And I said, hi, I called this stereo store, this electronic store, and I asked what the price was of this item. And they said that they couldn't tell me because it was illegal. Is that true? And the cop or dispatcher or whatever was like, I don't think so, but I'm not a lawyer and I'm not sure how you could get that information. I'm 90% sure it's not illegal. He's probably lying to you. But you can't quote me on that because I'm not allowed to give legal advice because I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, that's fair. How do I get the answer to that? And she said, call an attorney. So I called a bunch of attorneys and they were all like, who is this freaking kid calling me asking about stereo prices? And one guy goes, look, I can't engage with you because you're a minor. I'm not even supposed to be talking with you at all. But you can call this number and it's called friend of the court. And basically what this is, now that I'm an attorney, I know what this is. It's basically like legal aid for people that are poor, like indigent or, you know, just people who have nowhere else to go and they need legal resources. And this is like a pro bono legal thing. So I'm calling friend of the court and I'm leaving voicemails. I finally get a hold of somebody and they're like, look, I don't know why you really need to know the answer to this, but it's not illegal. That person was just lying to you. And I got the answer and I called the electronics store back and I got the same guy. And I said, by the way, it's not illegal, so you can tell me the price. And he hung up on me. Oh, this, is the, this is the funniest story. And the reason for me to ask that question without telling you why I did is because, uh, according to research, but who cares, is that the, the dreams and things we did and the mode we were in when we were right around 10 years old is basically what shaped us into who we are today. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of this is somehow, if you look at people working in law firms, financial services, and they tell you, you know what, my life is totally different. This is not how I am. I'm just putting a show here. Um, you know, I feel like oftentimes I have to, you really have to peel through the layers to really get to who people truly are. But based on that story, I realize I, I'm not surprised at all how you started, uh, founded Art of Charm, because that, that is who you are, and try to get to the bottom. And I, I love how you kind of is very inquisitive, and you ask questions, and, and especially when the guest is kind of contradicting himself or herself, you're like, could you explain that one more? Time? Why is that exactly? You know, and I love it. Well, I, I appreciate that. It's funny because I did want to be a talk show host when I was like eight years old and I bought the parts for this transmitter that would transmit to the radio. And um, one of the guys at Radio Shack, which like doesn't exist anymore, he goes, look, if you build this, it's not going to go very far. So you're not really going to be able to be kind of like the DJ for your neighborhood, which is I know what you want to do. Because I was there soldering things together. And this cool guy, who was probably like 19, was helping me do it because nobody knew how to solder anything in my house, even though my dad was a mechanical engineer. And, um, and so I, I said, well, how can I make it more powerful? And he goes, well, you would need what's called a high gain antenna. And you'd need something that's going to power this thing enough to put it through this high gain antenna. So I was saving up my money for a high gain antenna, which by the way, if you don't know what that is, which no one does, you ever see an old TV antenna on people's houses back in the day where it's like this 
this kind of metal pipe that sticks up and then there's metal pipes that stick out like a T and on that T there's like these little metal rods that are horizontal that that go out from that. It's ugly and it's ginormous and I thought, okay, I got to like hook this thing up to my bike or my fort in my backyard and figure out how to make this work and you know, it didn't work. But I always wanted to do that. And then I went to law school and became an attorney and all this stuff and I totally get what people mean by putting on a show. And while I was in law school, we actually started putting on this show, and this is my job now, and it's awesome. That's it's so funny. You you let me right into uh, the story of you talking about yourself. You know, as a I assume you were a very accomplished lawyer, and you talked about how hard you worked in law school, but the certain things didn't quite drive with you. But there's you know, there are snippets of things that you talk about, but because you're a host on those episodes, I know you don't want to go too, too deep in and turn into about yourself, but I was very drawn towards when you said, you know, being a lawyer, going to law school, getting into a top law school and, and drop out. And, uh, I'm not sure if you drop out or, or not, but to I graduated. Oh, you did. I, I practiced on wall street for a while. I'm definitely not an accomplished lawyer. I'm just technically a lawyer. I would not, don't, Trust me with any legal thing of any importance whatsoever. You'll regret it because I I graduated and I practiced on it, financial stuff on Wall Street and then just left really quickly after that. And it 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 actually ended up being pretty cool because I got paid for so much. So much of the startup capital from the Art of Charm came from this old firm on Wall Street that I worked for um, because I didn't have any work to do because I sucked at my job. <laughs> what <laughs> what age were you when you left the law firm? Um, twenty twenty eight, I wow. believe. That's perfect. Um, and then you start talking about the first few years of living in New York, if I remember correctly, Manhattan, and start. This is the very beginning of the Art of Charm, and you talked about something like ten twenty thousand dollars per year of income, and that was you didn't use the word suffocating, but I mean, what was that period of time like, and how did you persevere through that? And prepare yourself to see the light at, at the end of the tunnel. Oh, oh! You mean when I left Wall Street making a hundred and sixty grand, and I made twenty four thousand dollars a year after that? Yeah, you know, I had savings, so that was awesome. That was great because I basically didn't have to take that much of a ding in lifestyle. But on the other side of the coin, I wasn't on Wall Street for that long, so all that money that I had, I was still kind of in student mode. So occasionally I would splurge and buy really nice food, or I would overspend on clothing or something like that, or going out. But I was still kind of in law student mode, even though I was making Wall Street salary. So I was in, I ended up saving tons of my first year in salary and change uh, when I worked on Wall Street. And then I still got paid for a really long time, even though we had no work to do because of the economic downturn. And I still made full salary then. So the amount of money that I spent wasn't $24,000. I mean, it was, but I was able to kind of not care, I guess, because it, it, it didn't matter as long as I had a roof over my head that I had to go and eat cheap food or that I couldn't afford that much in, by way of going out. And also at that point, we'd really been leveraging that Art of Charm skill set. So we never paid for drinks and we never paid to get in anywhere and stuff like that. We basically just paid for taxis and you know our bills were paid for by the company at that point. So we didn't how long, how long, how long did that go for? It was a couple of years where we made very little money. And then it started to catch up with us. And, and then it didn't even sting because we were having so much fun. We were working with our friends and we, you know, there were tons of stressful periods of business, but we kind of didn't worry about it that much because we just figured everything would be okay in the end. Now, I don't recommend that because there's so many times when things are not okay in the end. In fact, I think it happens more often than not. Things are not okay in the end. And if I had the the choice to go back and start thinking of this as a business in the beginning rather than like a fun hobby that's kind of our job right now and hire all my dumb friends, I, I would do things a lot differently. But I, I don't know if that would have been a great idea either because I think the idea that it was so fun and we were so blissfully ignorant was what kind of led us through all of those lean times. I couldn't start Art of Charm over again and make it again. It would just be too damn hard. This is Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Face World Podcast. Today, I am with Jordan Harbinger, show host and coach from The Art of Charm. Jordan shares his nine-year journey of The Art of Charm from a passion project to a legacy business. But why, why was this so important to you? 
I mean, because it was so important. I mean, there was a job that was promising, a quote unquote, I'm air quoting, the guarantee, uh, your parents may be fully supportive, you can take girls out without money, go anywhere you want. And why was the art of charm or the idea to start something so profound that important to you? Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to rain on your really great question, but mostly I had never thought about that. I just didn't want to be a lawyer. I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. I thought this was fun for a while. I wasn't even sure if I was going to have to get a regular job at some point. We were helping so many guys, it became rewarding, but it wasn't like, all right, I'm going to save up and quit this law job and go pursue my passion, which is teaching and doing this podcast and blah, blah, blah. It was more like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. This is so cool. And the guys are having a lot of fun. We're going to be rich, maybe. Don't know. Bye. That was my whole thought process. Let's go get a beer, right? I mean, it was 29 and 28, if that. And it, I was immature probably even for that age, frankly, and I still am probably immature for my age. And so there wasn't a whole lot of deep thought behind, oh, you know, this is, we got to plan ahead and this is going to be a business. We're going to scale that way. That whole mindset, that whole, that's kind of a Silicon Valley thing that's trendy now where people think, all right, implementation, scaling, automation, these different phases of business, that stuff, nobody thought about that. Nobody was talking about that back then. There wasn't passive income. There still isn't, but there wasn't passive income then. It wasn't trendy. And we didn't treat the podcast like a business. I probably released an episode every two weeks. I did it in whatever room I could with the microphones that I had, and we were drinking the whole time. And then guys would show up for their boot camp, and then we would use that money to to pay for things that we needed. I mean, we weren't we were we were not planning ahead. We were not thinking this is some sort of undeniable passion. And it just kind of became that way because we're like, wow, this is so rewarding. And also we know what we're doing now and hey, you know, now it's more profitable than it was. But it, for years, we just never gave it a second thought. It was a, it was a hobby business and that was not a good way to start off with a bang. But I also think it was probably the only way that we were going to be able to make it. Because bear in mind, we weren't selling a better, what's that, what's that stupid analogy? We weren't selling a better widget. We were making up a training program that didn't exist before that we had created that we were constantly improving. And so we were not thinking like we're going to retire at age 40. I mean, that was not in the cards. This was let's kill time until we figure out what else everybody's going to do. So not that it's important to look back and say we want to change change X, Y, and Z, but if there were a couple of things you would do differently, uh, you know, if we were to start over again, what would that be? I would start focusing. I would focus on taking pride in the craft of everything that we were doing. Because back, if you listen to early episodes of Art of Charm, they're they're terrible. And I'm not just saying that because it's my podcast and I'm better at it now than I used to be. I mean, they're just like the audio quality stinks because I didn't care. I wasn't prepared for a lot of the interviews because I didn't care. I didn't release every single week at the same time because I just didn't really care. And several years ago, I thought, okay, I've got to start treating this like a business. And so I would start treating this like a business, like a legacy business instead of a lifestyle business. And the difference between those two things is a lifestyle business makes you enough money to do what you really want to do, which is for a lot of people like hang out and work from the beach. I don't do that. I am much too hyper for that. And back then I was sort of running around New York City and traveling around having fun, which may have been a necessary part of my growth as a, as a man and as a human. But I would have focused, again, 2020 hindsight, on creating a legacy business, which is quit screwing around, release the show regularly, figure out how to be a good host, get better equipment, get a producer and a team together, start promoting your stuff like a normal human being. Because I knew Ramit back in 2007, 2008, too. And wow. I was like, this guy really is focused on his business. We should do that. And he was just like, this is step one. I'm going to do this. I'm testing all this other stuff. We were not doing any of that. We weren't doing any of that stuff. Ramit Sethi was. And so there's a reason now that he's so much more advanced than like any other business that you look at. And we're, we've been lucky that we're probably up in that same sort of level of success as him, but I guarantee you he tested things that we tested just recently and he probably tested them almost a decade ago because he was always focused on that stuff while we were kind of just screwing around. And so I would have focused on this stuff earlier because 
I think that a lot of people, they treat their business like a hobby. And I don't mean just doing it part-time. I think you should start part-time so you prove the concept. But I think a lot of people start their business like a hobby because it's easier to do it that way. And if you fail at a hobby, you're like, whatever. But if you fail at your business, you feel like it affects who you are. It reflects, I should say, on who you are as a person. And um, that was something that, looking back, we were probably afraid of. And so I would ditch that fear and just start building faster. I love it. And I'm going to take, I'm definitely going to get a, a transcript for this and take careful notes and think about where I'm, what I'm doing, where I'm taking my business uh, in 2016. But I, I had this question from the very beginning. I, do you mind revealing some of the, the microphone where like kind of your brief setup because it sounds so good. Yeah, sure. I, I have none of this is secret. I should have my producer documented online somewhere so that people can buy this stuff. But let's see, I'll start from the power chain. So I've got a power conditioner, which I don't know, I, I probably don't need it now. But if you live in an older building, you know, man, I'm trying to figure out if there's an example of this. But you ever when you were a kid, plug a TV in and like whenever the washing machine turns on, the TV does something weird. So I've got this device called a power conditioner and it plugs into the wall and it cleans all of the electricity because through outlets in your house, there's not just a bunch of electricity. I'll spare you the science, but there's all kinds of frequencies and stuff going through there too. So this power conditioner gets all that and sort of scrubs it out and evenly distributes the right amount of voltage and amperage to all the devices that are plugged into it. So it's like a super smart spike bar. I don't think anybody needs that, but I have one. And then plugged into that is something called a uh, Universal Audio Apollo, and uh, that's a, it's an eight, eight uh, I or eight P, and that has a MacBook uh, Air plugged into it for my producer to come in on Skype, and it's got an iMac plugged into it, which is what I look at, which has my show notes and Logic X, which is recording the audio for every show. And there's also something running on it called console, and console is what controls the Apollo, and it has, it basically is a real-time emulator of all these old electronic processing units that, if you ever go to like a music studio, you see all these weird devices with cables sticking out of them that change the way that things sound like guitars and vocals and things like that, tube amplification. And th this device emulates all of that. So I have a, a proprietary sort of chain that changes my voice into what you hear. It, uh, and that's an exaggeration. My voice really sounds like this. It's just that it, cl it, it makes everything cleaner. It gets rid of static. It amplifies parts of my voice that I want amplified. And anytime I say like, if you do an S sound, it goes like, it'll remove that weird hissing sound that sounds really obnoxious in headphones. It removes uh, a lot of breath that comes through. It, it removes those things where if you're too close to the mic, you go, and it makes that like air pop sound. It removes a lot of that. So that is really powerful, and it's really a nice device that I have that most broadcasters don't bother with because it's expensive. And then I've got... Uh, Electro Voice RE20 microphone, which is a great vocals or drum microphone, the same microphone that I used at Sirius XM when I was doing live radio on Sirius XM satellite radio. I've got that, and it's in a shock mount so that if I bash the table, it doesn't do that thing where when a microphone is sitting on a table where it goes like this. You hear that? It doesn't do that. It's all isolated by rubber bands, and it's suspended from a band, and I invested in really nice cables so that there's no static from crummy uh, parts or interference because cables are basically antennas that pick up everything in the air. So I got really nice handmade isolated and insulated cables from Japan that I plug my microphone into the Apollo. And I've got a mute switch so that if I cough, I can push it and it doesn't go <clears throat> into the microphone and everybody's got to cut that out. I've got that. And then... Everybody has a separate channel, and this is probably even the most important thing. So when I'm recording a show, I've got my own track. You as a guest have your own track. My producer has his own track. So if we all talk over each other, my producer will just mute whoever he doesn't want, and the other person's audio will be unaffected. And if someone's quiet, I can amplify them without amplifying everybody else. And if they're really mousy sounding, I can add a little bit more bass to their voice, and if they're 
in a noisy area, I can eliminate background noise using a plugin for the Apollo interface on their channel so it gets rid of that stuff. So it really makes a huge difference when you're recording somebody on some crummy Skype thing and they're using their Apple headset versus going through all of these different plugins. It sounds like they're in studio or at least the next best thing. And, uh, and it's, it's, it took a lot to learn how to use this stuff. But the truth of the matter is we started going back to treating this like a business. This is a radio show. The chief distribution channel right now is on the internet. I don't know if that's going to be true all the time. I mean, we have replays on satellite radio. We may go to FM and stay on the internet. We may license things out to other people. I create video content in here. So I need professional equipment that sounds good because if we do go to radio, I don't want to have to figure out how to use all this stuff suddenly. And now I've got that learning curve along with a totally different one of being on on air or doing live again like I was with Sirius XM. So, so my chain, and oh, and it's all recorded on the computer and there's a backup. There's a Zoom recorder that's plugged into the Apollo as well that just gets all of the output and records it so that if if like there's a power failure or some catastrophic thing happens and my hard drive crashes, producer Jason has a backup on his end and I have a backup on my end. So we never lose shows anymore. Because the, the Lord knows when I was using call recorder, for Skype for all those years, if that crashed, you were just out of luck. That oh, was it. Oh, man, that's so miserable. But that, wow, that's amazing. Sorry to cut you off. You were, uh, did you mention the software you're using for editing post-production? I don't edit my own show. So we have an audio editor, and it's not producer Jason. It's actually another guy who's also named Jason. And uh, he goes through and he edits in, I don't know what that is. I guess it's either Logic which might be why I was instructed to get Logic so that I can just give him the whole project file. He'll edit in that program without me having to convert anything, which is great because that means he can mute the tracks and change everything. And then um, we have a show notes guy who creates the show notes after listening to the rough cut of the episode. And producer Jason does notes in real time where he'll be like, all right, minute 45, Jordan has coughing fit and then has to pee, cut three minutes of audio. <laughs> Your your show it's so so high quality and I love you know I, and then people who haven't gone to your website it's so detailed you got the show notes you have this key set of questions so it's very easy to scan uh, to say you know exactly what can I get out of this episode is it is it going to be very valuable and relevant to me um, so you know most shows are so like you said uh, the show notes are non existing and the their grammar mistakes I mean it's, it's a hot mess for a lot of podcasters out there. So. Yeah, it's um but I get it. I'm not like, "Ugh, what an amateur." I'm like, "Ugh, this is so much better than I was when I was a year old of a show." Like, I mean, our show was a hot mess for probably like 5 years. I mean, we didn't even look at our download stats. We didn't care. Nobody knew what podcasts were, so when people asked me what I did, I was like, "Uh, do you know what a podcast is?" and they would be like, "No." And I'd be like, "Uh, it's like YouTube with no video." And they're like, "That is never going to be a real thing that you can do to make money. And I'm like, it's nice meeting you. You know, I mean, what are you going to do? Now I'm like, do you know what a podcast is? And people go, uh, yeah, obviously. And I'm like, oh, well, I have a really popular one of those. And they're like, no way, listen to 85 podcasts. What's yours called? And if they haven't heard of it, now I got a new fan, right? So it's, uh, it's funny how things have changed. I mean, nine years ago when we were in iTunes, AJ and I looked at each other and we were like, look, no one's ever going to find this. There's like 800 podcasts in here. And now I think there's 300,000. And, uh, and I still think it's early enough that if you do get started and you do a good job and you treat it like a job and you love doing it, you'll be fine. Because look, Google is making it a native thing that you can play on Android phones. Spotify's got a limited amount of podcasts on there. I'm not sure how to find it. I know Art of Charm is on there. Somebody showed me once, you got to push a lot of buttons to get, but that's going to change. You know, your, your car is going to have CarPlay, whether or not it's an Android OS, uh, an Apple OS, or some crappy thing that Microsoft made for Ford or whatever is going to have that on there. Uh, and people are going to have it on their smartphones all the time, and they're going to eventually figure out, many people will, that radio is not their only option, and satellite radio is going to go out of business as soon as Howard Stern retires. So... Podcasts are still kind of early. It's just that it's not necessarily going to be called podcasting. It's just that 
everybody's going to be able to create their own thing, but people are going to start and companies like Spotify, Google, all these other companies, even iTunes to a certain degree are going to start to figure out how to cultivate the stuff that's professionally made. And if you're an, a seasoned, experienced host that's been treating this like your job for a long time, you're going to be the people they call when they want to test out the Google Play Store or the Spotify thing like we are. And it's great because what that means is if you're on the cusp of that and Google needs to feature 100 new shows, they're just going to take the iTunes Top 100 most likely. And if you're in there, you're going to get a million new listeners. And if you're not, you're you're going to have to work your way up like we did, you know, and it's it's uh it's really really cool because I'm looking forward to the next few years of seeing the podcasting market explode and watching, you know, hopefully my business do the same. Yeah. And it's so refreshing for me to hear this. And you know, Jordan, I I really appreciate your time and part of me feels like I don't want to let you go. I I miss talking to you already. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're a good host, and you did you obviously prepared really well for this, so I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. I, I, if you were here in this room with me, you would see about three pages of uh, research stuff. I probably have thirty questions, and I must admit, I didn't even look at it once, because I, I didn't need to. That's that's good. I I would say a great bit of prep. And Neil Strauss, who who writes for Rolling Stone, is a good friend of mine. He's an author as well. What he does is he writes down all the questions he wants to ask, and then he never looks at it. Yeah, exactly. So it's so funny. Krista Tibbis said the same thing. She prepares and the preparation allows you to not have to look at them. Otherwise, you, you just have, might have a, a panic attack. So Yeah. And you feel like you have to get it in. You do that thing. And I, I did this years ago where you go, oh, before I let you go, total non sequitur question that's not as valuable because you wrote it down. You feel like you have to finish the, the assignment when yeah. really it's just like, this should be done. You should ignore this. I don't need to ask you about your favorite, you know, brand of underwear. Nobody cares. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. And I it's so funny. I feel so good at this point and you just you make me so relaxed about our conversation and it just flew by. And I want to thank you for giving me this chance because, you know, after I I have been so transparent about my downloads and your reply, as I've told many people, is, you know, again, yours is over 2 million a month. And I said, you know, I have 50 episodes. I don't have any commercial or advertising. I have about over 10,000 downloads, about average 200 per episode. And your reply is like, cool, I'm in. And I will never for forget that, Jordan. I really, I really want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity and the fact that you're such a dedicated, um, there's so many words I want to use, you know, creator, you, you are a creative person for sure. And you're influencing so many people out there, not just men, but also women. Um, so please, I hope you do this as long as it's still interesting and powerful to you. And, um, I, it's so funny. I promise I'll give you an intro, but we hit it off so quickly. I, I never uh, needed to introduce myself, um, but I am a digital producer. I am going solo, uh, effective this Friday, leaving my full-time job to pursue. Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> I am so excited. I went through stages of uncertainty, fear, and now I'm excited. Uh, I, I will be working as a freelance consultant, helping small businesses, people, and students and uh, I would love to return this favor, even though you, you didn't think it was a favor, probably, but to find a way where I can contribute and kind of help the Art of Charm as uh, to kind of collaborate and partner with you in ways I can just volunteer my time, my knowledge will be, will be uh, an absolute honor to do so. Well, I appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to seeing how you... How you roll. By the way, those um, those feelings of like, I'm excited, and then I was uncertain. It, that never stops, so don't expect it to stop. I'm, I've been running my own business with my partners here for nine plus years, and I can count, we call it the entrepreneurial roller coaster, and my, my friend Cameron Harold, who I just interviewed on The Art of Charm, talks about this. You, you constantly go through that, and you're going to just going to happen until the day you retire, and then you're probably going to have nightmares about it. <laughs> so Sit true. I already had like different loops of these feelings like what's wrong with me, you know, and you're right. Maybe it's all natural. Yep, it's all totally natural. It's never going to, probably never going to go away. And that's just how you know you run your own business. And we're a human <laughs> being, right? We're still alive. <laughs> exactly, exactly.
Wow. Thank you, Jordan. I really appreciate it. And, and your time is absolutely precious. So please keep in touch and let me know if there's anything I can do to, to help you. And I will absolutely keep you posted on this episode. I think it's, it's going to be so successful. You got it. Thanks so much, Faye. Thank you. Take care. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.